Um, OK, hey, everyone. So welcome to the final week of uh, the class. Um, what I want to do today is share with you a few generalizations of um, reinforcement learning and of MDPs. So you've learned about the basic MDP formalism of states, action, state transition for release, discount factor, and reward. Um, the first thing you see today is two you know, slight generalizations of this framework to state action rewards and to finite horizon MDPs that'll make it a little bit easier for you to model certain types of problems, certain types of robots, or certain types of factory automation problems will be easier to model with these two uh, uh, small generalizations. So we'll talk about those first. And then second, we'll talk about linear dynamical systems. Um, last Wednesday, you saw fitted value iteration, which was a way to uh, solve for an MDP even when the state space may be infinite, even when the state space is a set of real numbers or it's Rn, so it's an infinite list of states, so a continuous set of states, we use fitted value iteration in which we had to use a function approximator, right, like linear regression, to try to approximate the value function. There's one very important special case of an MDP where even if the state space is infinite, uh, continuous real numbers, um, there's, that, well, there's one important special case where you can still compute the value function exactly without needing to use, you know, like a linear function approximator or to use something like linear regression in the inner loop of fitted value iteration. Um, and so you also see that today. And when you can take a robot or some factory automation task or whatever problem and model it in this framework, it turns out to be incredibly efficient because you can fit a continuous fitted value function as a function of the states without needing to approximate anything, just compute the exact value function, uh, even though the state space is continuous. So um, this is a framework that doesn't apply to all problems, but when it does apply, is incredibly convenient and incredibly efficient. So you see that in the second half of today. Um, Oh, yes, uh, oh, one, one tactical, oh, uh, two, two tactical things. Um, let's see, from the questions that we're getting from students, some students are asking us, oh, how is grading in CS239? What if I did well in this, you know, didn't do so well in that? Um, for people taking the class pass fail, a C minus or better is a passing grade. This is quite, I think this is standard at Stanford. Uh, and um, I think CS239 has historically been one of the heavy workload classes. We know that people taking CS239, yeah, I see a few heads nodding. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think, sorry, people, um, uh, uh, takes us to uh, end up, you know, putting a lot of work on this class, more, maybe, frankly, more than average for even Stanford classes. And so we've usually been quite nice with respect to, 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 to grading, partly and acknowledge that. So I think, uh, uh, yeah, just for what it's worth. So don't, 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 don't sweat too much. Do work hard for the final project, but just don't, don't sweat too much. Um, Oh, and uh, on Wednesday after class, I had a funny question. After I talked about the fitted value iteration question, uh, someone came up to me and said, hey, Andrew, um, you know, this algorithm you, you just told us, does it actually work? Like, if you, does it actually work on an autonomous helicopter? And the answer is yes. Uh, 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 the algorithms I'm teaching, you know, if you, uh, uh, the fitted value iteration, as you learned last week, it will work on flying an autonomous helicopter at low speed. So you fly very high speeds, very dynamic maneuvers, crazy bang flipping upside down. You, you, you need a bit more than that, but for flying a helicopter at low speeds, the, the exact algorithm that you learned uh, last Wednesday, uh, as well as any of the algorithms you learned today, including um, LQR, you know, if you actually ever need to fly an autonomous helicopter for real, these algorithms will actually work decently well, it'll work quite well for flying helicopter at low speeds. Maybe not at very, very high speeds and at crazy dynamic maneuvers, but at low speeds, these algorithms, pretty much as I'm presenting them, will work. So, um, okay. So the first generalization to the MDP framework that I want to describe is um, state action rewards. Um, and so, Um, so far, we've had the rewards be a function mapping from the states to the set of real numbers. And with state action rewards, um, this is a slight modification to the MDP formalism, where now the reward function, R, is a function mapping from states and actions to 
the rewards. Um, and so, you know, in an MDP, you start from a state S0, you take an action A0, then based on that, you get to S1, take an action A1, take a state S2, uh, get to state S2, take an action A2, and so on. And with a state action reward, the total payoff is written like this. Um, and this, is, uh, this, this, this allows you to model that different actions may have different costs. Uh, for example, in the little robot wandering around a maze example, um, maybe it's more costly for the robot to move than to stay still. And so uh, if you have an action for the robot to stay still, the reward can be you know, zero for staying still and a slight negative reward for moving because you're burning or because, because you're using electricity. Um, uh, yeah, right. Um, and so in that case, um, Bellman's equations becomes this, V star equals Um, where now you still break down the value of a state as a sum of the immediate reward plus the you know expected future rewards. But now the immediate reward you get depends on the action that you take in the current state. Right? So this is a, and so this is Bellman's equations. And if um, and notice that previously, you know, we had the max kind of over here, but now you need to choose the action A that maximizes your immediate reward plus your discounted future rewards, which is why the max kind of moved, right? If, if you look at the equation, oh, if you look at this equation, I guess the max had to move outside because now the immediate reward you get uh, depends on the action you choose at this step in time as well. So this is models that different actions. Um, may have different costs. Yeah? Uh, just to make clear, the max applies to the entire expression, not just the RSA? Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. The uh, max applies to the entire expression. Right. Yeah? Uh, so in this reformulation, the rewards are deterministic for the previous state and action formulation, as opposed to sort of like constituting that state? Let's see. So in this formulation, the rewards are deterministic based on the state and action. Yes, that is correct. So um, in this formulation, the reward depends on the um, current state and the current action, but not on the next state you get to. Right. Right. Um, okay. Oh, and by the way, there, there, there are multiple variations of formulations of MDPs, but this is um, one convenient one, I guess, the model that, that different costs. And I think, uh, and, and actually, and you're flying a helicopter, a common, um, formulation of this would be to say that yanking aggressively on the control stick uh, should be assigned a higher cost because yanking the control stick aggressively causes your helicopter to jerk around more. And so maybe you want to penalize that by setting reward function that you know, penalizes very aggressive maneuvers. Right? So these are ways, th th these gives you the, uh, as, a, as a problem designer, um, uh, sort of a more flexibility, right? Um, and then, uh, uh, and then finally, so let me just write this on top. In this formulation, um, the optimal action, so, uh, right, so in order to compute the value function, you can still use value iteration. Right, which is still, you know, V of S gets updated as basically the right-hand side from Bellman's equations. So. Um, value iteration works just fine for the state action reward formulation as well. And um, if you apply value iteration until V converges to V star, then the optimal action is, um, again, pretty much, is, is, is just the argmax of that thing. So, so pi star is just the uh, argmax of this thing. Where now, when you're given state, you want to choose the action that ma maximizes your immediate reward plus your expected future rewards. 
Okay. Um, yeah. So I think just maybe another example. Um, if you want to use an MDP to um, uh, plan a shortest route for a robot to say drive from here in Stanford to drive up to San Francisco, right? Then if it costs different amounts to drive on different road segments because of traffic or because of the uh, speed limit on different roads, then this allows you to say that, well, driving this distance on this road costs this much in terms of fuel consumption or in terms of um, time and so on, right? So the state action. Okay. Yeah. Or, or in factory maintenance, uh, if you send in a team to maintain a machine that has a certain cost versus if you do nothing that has a different cost, but then the machine breaks down, that has yet another cost depending on your actions. Right? Okay, so that was the first generalization. Um, the second generalization is the finite horizon MDP. Um, and in a finite horizon MDP, um, we're going to replace the discount factor gamma with a horizon time t. Uh, and and we'll, we'll just forget about the discount factor. And in the finite horizon um, MDP, the MDP will run for um, a, fi a finite number of t steps. So you start from state S0, take an action A0, get to S1, take action A1, get to state ST, take an action AT at time step t, and then the world ends, and then we're done, right? And so the payoff is this finite sum And, and kind of there's just a full stop at the end of that. Um, you could also apply discounting, but usually when you have a finite horizon MDP, maybe there's no need to apply discounting. And so um, this model is a problem where there are you know t time steps, and then the world ends after that, right? Uh, or well, world ends sounds a bit dire, but uh, um, you know, if you're flying an airplane or you're flying a helicopter, and you know you only have fuel you know, for 30 minutes, right? Uh, in an RC helicopter, you have 20, 30 minutes of fuel. Uh, then you know that you're gonna run this thing for 30 minutes and then you're done. And so the goal is to uh, accumulate as many rewards as possible up until you, you know, run out of fuel and then you have to land, right? So that'd be an example of a finite horizon MDP. Now, um, and, and, and the goal is to maximize this payoff um, or the expected payoff over these t time steps. Okay. Now, one interesting uh, property of a finite horizon uh, of a finite horizon MDP is that the action you take uh, may depend on what time it is on the clock. Right. So there's a clock marching from you know time step zero to time step t, whereupon right the world ends, or whereupon that's all the rewards the MDP is trying to collect. And one interesting effect of this is that, um, this pen isn't that bright, is that um, the optimal action may depend on what, uh, what the time is on the clock. So uh, let's say your robot is running around this maze and there's a small plus one reward here and a much larger plus 10 reward there. And um, let's say your robot is here, right? Then the optimal action for whether you go left or go right will depend on how much time you have left on the clock. If you have only you know, two or three time steps left on the clock, it's better to just rush and get the plus one. But if you still have you know, 10, 20 ticks left on the clock, then you should just go and get the plus 10 reward, right? And so in this example, pi star of s, um, it's not well defined because, well, the, the optimal action to take when your robot is here in this state, should you go left or should you go right? Um, it actually depends on what time it is on the clock. And so pi star in this example um, should be written instead pi star subscript t of s uh, because the optimal action um, depends on what time 
tier this. The technical term for this is that this is a non-stationary, non-stationary <coughs> policy. Um, and non-stationary means uh, it depends on the time. Uh, actually, it changes over time. Right. Whereas in contrast, uh, up until now, we've been saying, you know, pi star of s is the optimal policy before we before this formalism, right? We just said pi star of s, and that was a stationary policy. And stationary means uh, does not change. Over time, okay. So one 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 thing that um, I didn't quite prove, but that was implicit, was that the optimal action you take in the original formulation uh, is the same action, right? Uh, no matter what time it is in the MDP. So in the original formulation that you saw last week, the optimal policy was stationary, meaning that the optimal policy is the same policy. You know, no matter what time it is, it doesn't change over time. Whereas in the fine horizon MDP setting. Um, the auto policy, you know, the auto action changes over time, and so this is a non-stationary policy. So stationary versus non-stationary just means does it change over time or does it not change over time? Okay. And so, um, right. If you're using a non-stationary policy anyway, uh, you can also build an MDP with non-stationary transition probabilities or non-stationary rewards non-stationary um, <coughs> actually so maybe here's an example um, let's say you're driving from campus from Palo Alto to San Francisco and uh, we know that rush hour is at what like 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. or something right and, and, and maybe maybe the weather forecast even says it's gonna rain at 6 p.m. or something right but so you know that the dynamics of how you drive your car from here to San Francisco will change over time uh, as in the time it takes you know to drive on a certain segment of the road is a function of time and if you want to build an MDP to solve for, um, the best way to drive from here to San Francisco say then <coughs> the state transitions um, so st plus one is drawn from state transition probability is indexed by the state at time t and the action at time t. And if these state transition probabilities change over time, then um, if you index it by the time t, this would be an example of a non-stationary um, of a non-stationary state transition probabilities. Okay? Um, or, or alternatively, if you want non-stationary rewards, then you can have R superscript T of S A uh, is the reward you get for taking a certain action, um, uh, you know, or for, for being in a certain state at a certain time. Okay, um, so all of these are different variations of of, of MDPs, um, and so maybe just a few examples of when you would want a uh, fine horizon MDP or use um, a non-stationary uh, state transitions. Uh, so let's see. Um, if you're flying an airplane, right, for, for, for some airplanes, uh, something like for commercial, for, for very large commercial airplanes, uh, sometimes over a third of the weight of the airplane comes from the fuel, right? So actually, if you take on a large commercial airplane, you know, when you take off uh, from uh, SFO and you fly to, I don't, know, I don't know where you guys fly to, I don't know, fly to, uh, a flight to London or something, right? Sorry, direct flight from here to London. Uh, by the time the plane lands, it's actually a much lighter airplane than when you took off. Um, because um, maybe sometimes, maybe like a third of the weight disappeared, you know, because of burning fuel. And so the, the dynamics, the, um, how an airplane feels between takeoff and landing is actually different because the weight is dramatically different. And so um, uh, this would be one example of where the state transition priorities changes in a pretty predictable way, right? Um, or, oh, right, already mentioned um, uh, weather forecasts. Right, where uh, weather forecast or traffic forecast, if you're driving here, or uh, yeah, drive, you know, if, if, you have, if you're driving over different types of terrain over time, and you know that it's going to rain tomorrow, uh, or you're going to know it's going to rain tonight, and the ground will turn muddy, you know, then or, or the traffic will turn bad, um, uh, and then I don't know industrial automation. Um, 
I see a lot of friends work on industrial automation, and I think that maybe one example, um, if you run a factory 24 hours a day, then the cost of labor, you know, getting people to come into the factory to do some work at noon is actually easier, right, and less costly than getting someone to show up at the factory to do some work at 3 a.m., right? And so depending on um, uh, really labor availability over time, the cost of taking different actions, uh, and the cost of, um, and, and the likelihood of transitioning to different state transition priorities can vary over the 24 hour clock as well, right? And so th these are other examples of when um, uh, uh, you can have a non stationary policy and non stationary state transitions. Okay? Now, um, let's talk about how you would actually solve for a finite horizon MDP. And I think for the sake of simplicity, uh, for the most part, I'm going to not bother with non stationary transitions and rewards. So for the, for the most part, I'm just focused on, for the most part, I'm just going to forget about you know, the fact that this could be varying. Um, well, I'll, I'll mention it briefly, but I, I want to focus on the finite horizon aspect. So, uh, all right. so let me define um, the optimal value function Um, so this is the auto value function for time t for starting in the state s. So this is the um, uh, expected total payoff. Starting in state s at time t, and if you execute you know, the best possible policy. Okay. So now the um, optimal value function depends on what time it is. Uh, because if, if you look at I don't know, that example of the plus one reward on the left and the plus 10 reward on the right, depending on how much time you have left on the clock, the amount of rewards you can accumulate can be quite different. Right? If you have more time, you have more, then you know, you can more time to get to the plus 10 reward in the, in the plus one and plus 10 reward that I drew, example that I drew just now. And so, um, in this example, value iteration um, becomes the following. It actually becomes a dynamic programming algorithm, uh, which you see in a second, okay? Which is that, let's see. Um, shoot, all right, I think I need three lines. Let me just do this here. which is that V star of T of S is equal to max over A R of S A plus Okay. Um, and uh, Actually, this is a question for you. So there's, there's, there's one missing thing here, right? So we're saying that the optimal value you can get when you start up in state S at time t is the max over all actions of the immediate reward plus sum of S prime, state transition values S prime times V star of S prime, and then what should go in that box? T of one. okay, cool, awesome, great. Right? Um, and then pi star of S is just, you know, arc max of A, right, of the, of the same thing, of this whole 
expression up on top. Um, and so this formula defines vt as a function of vt plus one. So this is like, um, this is like the iterative step, right? Given v10, you can compute v9. Given v9, you can compute v8. Given v8, you can compute v7. Um, and so to start this off, there's just one last thing we need to define, which is v capital T at the finite step, uh, at, at the final step, when the clock's about to run out, um, all you get to do is choose the action A, that maximizes the immediate reward, and then, and then, and then there's no sum after that, right? So um, if you start off at state S at the final time step T, then you get to take an action and you get an immediate reward, and then there is no next state because the world just ends right after that step, which is why um, the auto value at time t is just max over a of the immediate reward because what happens after that doesn't matter. Okay, so this is a dynamic programming algorithm in which this um, uh, uh, algorithm, this step on top, defines you know, allows you to compute v star of t. And then the inductive step, or the n plus one step, I guess, is uh, if you then, having computed v star of t for every state s, right? So you, you, know, so you compute this for every state s. Having done this, you can then compute v star t minus one using this um, inductive step. Then v star t minus two, and so on, down to v star of zero. So you compute this for every state. And then based on these, you can compute, oh, sorry, so you pi star of t. Right, compute the auto policy, the non-stationary policy um, for every state as a function of both the state and the time. Okay. Um, all right, cool. And and I think uh, again, I don't want to dwell on this, but if you want to work with non-stationary state transition probabilities or non-stationary rewards, then this algorithm hardly changes uh, in that you can just add. Um, you know, if, if your rewards and state transition variables are indexed by time as well, then this is just a very small modification to this algorithm. And it turns out that once you're using a finite horizon uh, MDP, making the rewards and state transition variables non-stationary is, is just a small tweak, right? So you could, yeah. Yeah. Um, can you say that again? This one? Oh, a non-stationary. So in the end, you get a policy pi star subscript T of S. So? I'm sorry. Oh, this one? Oh, this one? Oh, I see. Sure, yes. Oh, a pi star. This is a non-stationary policy. Yes. Oh, that's what I meant. Yeah. So this, the, the auto policy will be a non-stationary policy. Yes, uh, I, I think, I, yes, I, I think uh, I was using pi star to, to, to not, not to denote that it uh, has to be a fixed function of time, but yes, that's a non-stationary policy. Thank you, yeah. Uh, uh, right, if you take big T to infinity, can this become the usual value iteration? Um, so the, let me think. So there are two things with that. Uh, um, so the two frameworks are closely related, right? You can kind of see the relationship between the valuation. Um, one problem with taking this framework to big T to infinity is that um, the values become unbounded, right? As in, yeah, we, we, and, and that's actually one of the reasons why we use the discount factor when you have an infinite horizon MDP, when the MDP just goes on forever. One of the things the discount factor does is it makes sure that um, uh, the value function doesn't grow without bound, right? And in fact, you know, if, if the rewards are bounded by, um, right, by some R max, then when you use discounting, then V, you know, is bounded by, I guess, R max over one minus gamma, right? By, by the sum of the geometric sequence. Uh, and so, but, but in the final horizon MVP, because you only add up T rewards, it, it can't get bigger than T times the R max. Uh, 
let me think. So I think that, um, boy, so I think, you know, what you find is that, um, uh, let's see. Um, actually, yeah, let, let me just draw a 1D grid just to make life simpler, right? So let's say there's a plus 1 reward there and a plus 10 reward there. If you look at the optimal value function, um, depending on what time it is, if you have two times, and, and let's, or let's say the, 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 the um, dynamics are deterministic, right? Uh, so there's no noise. Then if you have two time steps left, then I guess V star would be, um, you know, 10, 10, 10, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, right? And so uh, depending on where you are, I guess if you're, uh, 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 yeah, actually, in fact, I guess if you're here, there's nothing you can do, right? You just can't get to either reward in time. Uh, but depending on whether you're here or here or here, the optimal action will, will change if you compute what this pi star. Does this make sense? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Oh, okay, cool, yeah. Maybe, do, do encourage you to, um, if, if this, yeah, if, if you actually um, uh, built a little, you know, grid simulator and use these equations to compute pi star and v star, you will see that the optimal policy, when you have lots of time, uh, will be this. Wherever you are, go for the 10 reward. Uh, but when the clock runs down, then the auto policy will end up being a mix of go left and go right. All right, cool. Hope that was okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, so the last thing I want to share with you today is uh, linear quadratic regulation. QR. And as I was saying at the start, um, LQR applies only in a relatively small set of problems, but whenever it applies, this is a great algorithm, and I just, you know, use it whenever, right? It seems usable to apply because it uh, uh, is very efficient and sometimes gives very good control policies. And um, let's see. And so LQR um, applies in the following setting. So let's see, in order to specify an MDP, we need to specify the states, the actions, the state transition properties. Um, I'm going to use the finite horizon formulation, so capital T and the reward. Uh, this, this also works with the discounted MDP formalism, but this would be a little bit easier, a little bit more convenient to develop with the finite horizon setting, so let me just use that today. And um, LQR applies uh, under a specific set of circumstances, which is that the set of states is an Rn, um, set of actions is an Rd, and so to specify the state transition probabilities, we need to tell you what's the distribution of the next state given the previous state. So to specify the state transition probabilities, I'm going to say that the way st plus 1 evolves is going to be as a linear function Um, some matrix A times ST plus some matrix B times AT plus some noise. And sorry, there's a little bit of um, notation overloading again. Sorry about that. A is both the set of actions as well as this matrix A, right? So there's two separate things, but same symbol. Um, uh, I, think, I think that the, the, the field of uh, a lot of the ideas from LQR came from traditional controls. Um, it's from uh, what from um, I guess from double E and mechanical engineering. A lot of the ideas from reinforcement learning came from computer science. So these two literatures kind of evolved, uh, and then when the literatures merge, you end up with clashing notations. So CS people use A to denote the set of actions, and uh, the the so, you know mechanical engineering and double E people use A to denote this matrix. Uh, uh, and when we merge these two literatures, the notation ends up being overloaded. Right? Um, Okay. Oh, and then um, uh, it turns out one thing we'll see later is that this noise term 
it, it, we'll, we'll see later, is actually not super important. But for now, let's just assume that the noise term is distributed Gaussian with some mean zero and some covariance sigma subscript w, okay? But we'll see later that the noise will, will be less important than you think. Um, right, and so this matrix A is going to be R n by n, and this matrix B is going to be R n by d, where n and d are respectively the dimensions of the state space and the dimension of the action space. So um, for driving a car, for example, we saw last time that maybe the state space is six dimensional. So if you're driving a car, maybe the state space is x, y, theta, x dot, y dot, um, theta dot. And the action space is um, uh, uh, you know, steering control. So maybe A is two dimensional, right? Uh, acceleration and steering. Okay, so let's see. So to specify an MDP, we need to specify this five tuple, right? So we specified um, three of the elements. Uh, the fourth one, T, is just some number, right? So that's easy. And then the final assumption we need to apply LQR is that the reward function has the following form. That the reward is negative of um, S transpose U S plus A transpose V A, where U um, is N by N, V is uh, D by D, and U, V are a positive semi-definite, okay? So these are matrices bigger than zero, so positive semi-definite. Um, so the fact that U and V are positive semi-definite, that implies that STUS is greater than or equal to zero, and uh, sorry, S transpose US, sorry, A transpose VA is also greater than or equal to zero, okay? So here's one example. Um, if you want to fly an autonomous helicopter, and if you want, you know, the state, vec uh, the state vector to be close to zero. So the state vector captures the position, orientation, velocity, angular velocity. If you want a helicopter to just hover in place, then maybe you want the state to be, you know, regulated or to 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 be controlled near some zero position. Um, and so if you choose. Uh, U equals the identity matrix, and V also equal to the identity matrix. Uh, these these would be different dimensions, right? This would be an n by n identity matrix. This would be a d by d identity matrix. Then R of S A ends up equal to negative norm of S squared plus norm of A squared. Okay, and so um, this allows you to um, uh, this allows you to specify a reward function that penalizes, you know, with a quadratic fu cost function, the state deviating from zero, or if you want, the actions deviating from zero, thus penalizing very large jerky motions on the control sticks. Um, or if we set V equal to zero, then the second term goes away, okay? So these are some of the cost functions you can specify um, uh, in terms of a quadratic cost function, okay? Um, now, again, you know, just so that you can see the generalization, um, if you want non-stationary dynamics, this model uh, is quite simple to change where you can say the matrices A and B depend on the time T. Uh, you can also say these, you know, the matrices U and B depend on the time T. So if you have non-stationary state transition probabilities or non-stationary, uh, cost function. Um, that's how you would modify this, but um, I won't. I won't use this generalization for today. Okay. Now,
so the two key assumptions of the LQR framework are that first, the state transition dynamics, the way your states change is as a linear function of the previous state and action plus some noise. And second, that the reward function is a near quadratic cost function, right? So these are the two key assumptions. Um, and so first, you know, where, where, where do you get um, the matrices A and B? One thing that we talked about on Wednesday already was, um, so again, this will actually work if you're trying to apply LQR to fly in the harness helicopter. This will work for helicopter flying at low speeds, um, which is if you fly the helicopter around, oops, you know, start to some state S0, take an action A0, um, get to state S1, do this until you get to ST, right? And then this was the first trial and then you do this m times, right? So we talked about this on Wednesday. So fly the helicopter through m trajectories of t time steps each, um, and then we know that we want st plus one is approximately ast plus bat, and so you can minimize So um, we want the left and the right-hand side to be close to each other so you could, you know, minimize the square difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side uh, in, a, in a procedure a lot like linear regression in order to fit matrices A and B. So if you actually fly a helicopter around um, uh, and collect this type of data and fit this model to it, this will work. You know, this, this, this is actually like a pretty reasonable model for the dynamics of a helicopter at low speeds, okay? So this is one way to do that. Um, so let's see, method one is to learn it, right? A second method is to linearize a nonlinear model. Okay. So um, let me just describe the ideas at a, at a high level, um, which is, let's say that, and, and I think for this it might be um, useful to think of the inverted pendulum, right? So that was, a, you know, so imagine you have a, uh, uh, yeah, inverted pendulum, that was that, right? You have a pole and you're trying to, you have a long vertical pole, and you're trying to keep a pole balance. Um, so for an inverted pendulum like this, if you download an open source physics simulator or if you have a friend, you know, from, from the, with a physics degree, uh, help you derive the Newtonian mechanics equations for this. Um, uh, let's see, I, I actually tried to work through the, the physics equations for inverted pendulum ones. It's pretty complicated, actually. I don't know. Um, but you might have a function that tells you that if the state is a certain position, orientation of the pole, velocity, angular velocity, and you, um, uh, what is it, um, apply a certain acceleration, the action is accelerate left or accelerate right, then, you know, one-tenth of a second later, the state will get to this, right? So, so your, your, your physics friend can help you derive this equation. Um, and, uh, and, and then maybe plus noise, right? Well, let, let me just ignore the noise for now. Um, and so what you have is a function maps from the state, um, x, x dot, theta, theta dot, that's the position of the cart and the angle of the pole and the velocities and angular velocities that maps from the current state at time t, uh, oh, excuse me, 
comma at, right, maps from the, I guess, current state vector to the next state vector um, as a function of the current state and the current action. Okay, so um, here's what linearization means. And uh, I'm going to use a 1D example. So because I can only draw on a flat board, right, I can't, you know, because, because of the two-dimensional nature of the whiteboard, um, I'm just going to use a, let's, let's suppose that you have st plus 1 equals f of st. And let me just forget, let me just ignore the action for now. So I have one input and one output so I can draw this more easily on a whiteboard. Um, So if you have some function like this, so the x-axis is st, and the y-axis is st plus 1, and this is the function f. Right, we'll plug in back the um, action later. What the linearization process does is um, you pick a point, and I'm going to call this point st over bar, and we're going to you know, take the derivative of f and fit a straight line. Sorry, I'm not drawing a straight line very well. Take the tangent straight line at this point, st bar. And, um, what, uh, and, and we're going to use this straight line. Actually, let's draw that in green. Right. And we're going to use the green straight line to approximate the function and so if you look at the equation for the green straight line, um, the green straight line is a function mapping from st to st plus 1. And s bar is the point around which you're linearizing the function. So s bar um, is a constant. And this function is actually defined by st plus 1 um, is approximately the derivative of the function at s bar times st minus s bar plus f of s bar t, okay? Um, and so, uh, so s bar t is a constant, right? And this equation expresses st plus 1 as a linear function of st. Okay. So think of s bar t as a fixed number, right? It doesn't vary. So given some fixed s bar, um, this equation here, this is actually the equation of the green straight line, which is it says, you know, if, if you use the green straight line to approximate the function f, this tells you what is st plus 1 as a function of st, and this is a you know, linear or an affine relationship between st plus 1 and st. Okay? Um, so that's how you would linearize a function. Um, and, and in the more general case, where... Um, And in the more general case where um, st plus 1 is actually a function of, you know, putting this back in, right, both st and at, um, the formula becomes, um, uh, let me see, um, well, I'll, I'll write out the formula in a second. Uh, but um, in this example, s bar t is usually chosen to be a typical value for s, right? And so, in particular, if you expect your helicopter to be doing a pretty good job hovering near the state zero, then uh, it'd be pretty reasonable to choose s bar t to be the vector of all zeros. Because if you look at how good is the green line as an approximation of the blue line, Right. In a small region like this, you know, the green line is actually pretty close to the blue line. And so if you choose S bar to be the place where you expect your helicopter to spend most of its time, then the green line is not too bad an approximation to the true function, to the physics. Oh, excuse me. Well, if you expect for the inverted pendulum, if you expect that your inverted pendulum will spend most of its time with the pole upright and the velocity not too large, then you choose S bar to be maybe the zero vector. Um, and so long as your pendulum, your inverted pendulum, is spending most of its time kind of, you know, close to the zero state, then the green line's not too bad an approximation for the blue line, right? So this is an approximation, but you try to choose um, 
uh, because I mean, in, in this little region, it's actually not that bad an approximation. Uh, it's only when you go really far away, right, that there's a huge gap between the linear approximation um, and the true function f. Okay. Um, all right. And so, um, in the more general case where f is a function of both the state and the action, then what you have to do is uh, the input now becomes st comma at because f maps from st comma at to uh, st plus one, and then instead of choosing s bar t, you're choosing s bar t comma a bar t, which is a typical state and action uh, around which you linearize the function. Uh, let me just write down the formula for that. you would say if you linearize f around a point given by s bar t a bar t, kind of the typical values, then the formula you have is s t plus 1 is given by f of s bar t a bar t plus the gradient with respect to s transpose st minus s bar okay so this is the generalization of the 1d function we measured just now or we wrote down just now which says that you know the next state is approximately this point around you which you linearize plus the gradient with respect to s times how much the state differs from the linearization point plus the gradient with respect to the actions times how much the action vary from A bar. Okay. And this kind of generalizes that equation you wrote. So, um, so this equation expresses st plus 1 as a uh, linear function, or technically an affine function, of the previous state and the previous action, right, with some matrices in between. And from this, you know, after some algebraic munging, you could re-express this as st plus 1 equals ast plus bat. Um, and, and just th there is just one other little detail, which is um, you might need to redefine st to add an intercept term. Right, and because it's an it's a affine function with an intercept term rather than a linear function. But so from this formula, you know, with a little bit of algebraic monging, you should be able to figure out what are the matrices A and B, uh, uh, but you might need to add an intercept term to the S, but this is just an affine function. You can rewrite in terms of matrices A and B, okay? Um, all right, so, Right. I hope that makes sense, right? That this thing, this linearization thing, expresses st plus 1 as a linear function of st and at, right? This is just a linear, just the, the way st plus 1 varies, you know, it's just some matrix times st, some matrix times at, um, and that's why with some munging you can get into this formula for some matrix a and b, okay? Um, but because there's some constants floating around as well, like this, you might need an extra intercept term to multiply into a to give you that extra constant. But where we are, um, we now have that for these MDPs, either by learning a linear model with the matrices A and B, um, or by taking a nonlinear model and linearizing it, like you just saw, you can model, or hopefully model an MDP as a, um, a linear dynamical system, meaning this, you know, ST plus one is this linear function of the previous state in action as well as hopefully with a quadratic reward function or the really like a, a, right, in, in the form that we saw just now. Um, so 
let me just summarize the problem we want to solve. AST, oops, sorry, sorry. ST plus 1 equals AST plus BAT plus WT. So this is a noise term. Um, and then R of S A equals negative S transpose US plus A transpose VA. Right? And this is a fine horizon MDP, so the total payoff is a R of S0 a0 plus dot 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 plus R of ST AT. Okay? So, let's take out the dynamic programming algorithm for this. The remarkable problem, the, the remarkable property of um, LQR. Um, and what makes this so useful is that if you are willing to model your MDP using those sets of equations, then the value function is a quadratic function, right? Um, and so let me show you what I mean. And so if, you're, if your model, if your MDP can be modeled as this type of linear dynamical system with a quadratic cost function, uh, then it turns out that V star is a quadratic function, and so you can compute V star exactly. Um, so let me show you what I mean. We're going to develop a dynamic programming algorithm to compute the um, optimal value function V star. Similar to uh, what we did you know, a little earlier today with the finite horizon MDP with a finite set of states, let's start with the final time step and it will work backwards. So um, V star T of ST is equal to max over AT of R of ST AT. Um, this is max over AT of uh, negative right. Um, but this is always greater than or equal to zero because V is positive semi-definite. And so the optimal action is actually to just choose the action zero. Um, and so the max over this is equal to negative ST transpose UST, right? Because, uh, because V is a positive semi-definite matrix, this thing is always greater than zero. And then, and so this tells us also that pi star at the final action is the arg max. So the optimal action is to choose you know, the vector of zero actions at the last time step, okay? So this is the base case for the dynamic programming step of um, value iteration where uh, the optimal value at the last time step is just choose the action that maximizes the immediate reward, um, which means maximize this, right? And this is maximized by choosing the action zero at the last time step. Now, I feel like these blue pens keep, what's the other thing there? Ooh, okay. Now, the key step to the dynamic programming implementation is the following, which is, um, suppose that V star t plus 1, st plus 1, is equal to a quadratic function So in the oh. yes, it's true that this term is also greater than zero uh, without the minus sign, right? Without the minus sign, that term is positive, and so, uh, but you only get to maximize with respect to at. 
right? So, so the best you could do for this term is set it to zero. Yeah. Thank you. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, all right. Now, for the inductive case, um, we want to go from vt plus 1, v star t plus 1, to computing v star t, right? And the key observation that makes LQR work is um, let's suppose v star t plus 1, the auto value function at the next time step, let's suppose it's a quadratic function. So in particular, let's suppose v star t plus 1 is, you know, this quadratic function uh, parameterized by some matrix, uh, this capital phi t plus 1, which is an n by n matrix, and some constant offset psi, which is a real number. Um, what we'll be able to show is that if you do one step of dynamic programming, um, if this is true for v star t plus 1, that vt after one step, as you go from v star t plus 1 to vt, that the optimal value function vt is also going to be a quadratic function with a very similar form, right? with, with I guess t plus 1 replaced by t. Right? Um, and so in the dynamic programming step, um, we are going to update vt st equals max over at r of st comma at plus um, and then you know I think you remember right previously um, well, let me write this in green previously we had sum over s prime of actually st plus one I guess uh, so the st at st plus one v star t plus one st plus 1. So that's what we had previously when we had a discrete state space and we're summing over it. But now that we have a continuous state space, this formula becomes um, expected value with respect to st plus 1 drawn from the state transition probabilities um, of v star p plus 1 st plus 1. So the optimal value when the clock is at time t is choose the action A that maximizes the immediate reward plus the expected value of you know, your future rewards when the clock has now ticked from time t to time t plus 1, and you're in state st plus 1 at time t plus 1. Right? So um, let's see. So uh, this is a pretty beefy piece of algebra to do. Um, I think, I feel like showing this full result is, I don't know, is like at the level of complexity of a you know, typical CS229 homework problem, uh, which is quite hard. <laughs> um, uh, but let me just show the outline of how you do this derivation and why you know, why this inductive step works, right? But I think you, but, but if you want, you could work through the algebra details yourself at home, um, which is that, actually, let me do this on the next board. Oh. So v star t of st is equal to max over at of the immediate reward, right? So that's the immediate reward. And then plus the expected value with respect to st plus 1 is drawn from a Gaussian with mean ast plus bat and covariance sigma w. Uh, so remember, st plus 1 is equal to ast plus bat plus uh, wt, where wt is Gaussian with mean 0 and covariance sigma w. Right? So uh, if you choose an action at, then this is the distribution of the next state 
at time t plus 1. Um, and then expected value of this quadratic term. Um, because this quadratic term here, kind of in the inductive case, was what we showed was v star uh, for, the, for the next time step. Right? So it turns out that, um, let's see, so this is a quadratic function. And this expectation is the expected value of a quadratic function with respect to s drawn from a Gaussian, right, with a certain mean and a certain variance. So it turns out that um, the expected value of this thing, right, well, this whole thing that I just circled, this thing simplifies into a, a big quadratic function. of the action AT, right? Um, and then, uh, and so in order to, you know, derive the argmax or to derive V star of S, you would derive this big quadratic function, um, take derivatives with respect to AT, uh, set to zero, right, and solve for AT, okay? And if you go through all that algebra, then you actually, then you end up with the formula for AT as follows. Um, And um, I'm going to use, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to take that big matrix and denote that LT, okay? Um, oh, and so this shows also that pi star at time t of ST is equal to LT times ST, okay? So, um, One, the, the takeaway from this is that under the assumptions we have, right, linear dynamical systems with quadratic cost function, uh, the optimal action is a linear function of the state st, right? And uh, this is not a claim that is made through function approximation. Uh, what did, I'm, I'm not saying that you can fit a straight line to the optimal action, and if you fit a straight line, that you get this linear function, right? That's not what we're saying. We're saying that um, of all the functions anyone could possibly come up with in the world, linear or nonlinear, the best function, the best action is linear. So there is no approximation here, right? So it's just that, you know, it's just a fact that if you have a linear dynamical system, the best possible action at any state is going to be a linear function um, uh, of, of that state, right? So there's no, there's, we haven't approximated anything, right? Um, let me see. Let me, let, me, let me write this here. Um, and then the other step is that uh, if you take the auto action and plug it into the definition of V star, then by simplifying, which again is quite a lot of algebra, but after simplifying, you end up with this equation. Um, where, again, I'll, I'll just write out the formulas, just, you know.
Um, so to summarize the whole algorithm, right? Let's let's put everything together. Oh, and and so, sorry. And so what these two equations do is they allow you to go from v star t plus one, which is defined in terms of phi t plus one and psi t plus one, and it allows you to recursively go back to figure out what is v star t using these two equations, right? So phi t depends on phi t plus one. Psi t depends on phi t plus one and psi t plus one. Uh, and this sigma w, this is the covariance of uh, wt, right? The, the sigma subscript w. This is not a summation over w. This is a sigma matrix subscripted by w. That was the covariance matrix for the noise terms we were adding on every step in our linear dynamical system. Okay, and, and this is a trace operator, some of the diagonals. Okay. So just to summarize, um, here's the algorithm. You would initialize phi t to be equal to negative u and psi t equals zero. Um, and so, you know, that's just taking this equation and mapping it there, right? So the final time step, uh, that those two, oh, sorry, it should be capital T, right? So that, um, those two equations, the phi and psi, it defines V star of capital T. And then you would, um, you know, recalculate, calculate, um, phi t and psi t using phi t plus one and psi t plus one. So you go from, you know, for t equals t minus one, t minus two, and so on, and go backward, count down from, right, t minus one to t minus two, and so on, down to zero. Um, calculate LT as above, right? And LT was a formula, I guess, we had over there um, saying how the optimal action is a function of the current state depending on the A and B and phi. Uh, and then finally, pi star of ST equals LT of ST, okay? Um, and this algorithm, the remarkable thing, one, one really cool thing about LQR is that there is no approximation anywhere, right? You, you might need to um, make some approximation steps in order to approximate a helicopter as a linear dynamical system by you know, fitting a matrices A and B to data or by taking a nonlinear thing and linearizing it. And you might need to just restrict, constrict, uh, uh, you know, restrict your choice of possible reward functions, reward function that's quadratic. But once you've made those assumptions, none of this is approximate. Everything here is exact. Right, so question? Yes, that's right. Yep, yeah. So the approximation steps needed are uh, uh, getting your MDP into the form of a linear dynamical system with a quadratic reward. So that is approximate. But once you specify the MTP like that, all of these calculations were exact, right? So, so we're not approximating the value function with a quadratic function. Is that the value function is a quadratic function and you're computing it exactly. And the optimal policy is a linear function and you're just computing, computing that exactly, okay? Um, I want to mention, before we wrap up, I want to mention one, one unusual fun fact about LQR, and this is very specific to LQR, um, uh, and, and, and it's convenient, uh, but, but it, uh, uh, let, let me say what the fact is, and just be careful that this doesn't give you the wrong intuition, because it doesn't apply to anything other than LQR, which is that um, if you look at where, um, so first, if you look at the formula for L, well, let me just move this around, <coughs> all right? If you look at the formula for LT, you need to compute, I mean, the, uh, you know, you're, the goal of doing all this work is to find the auto policy, right? So you wanna find LT so you can compute the auto policy. You notice that LT um, just depends on phi 
but not psi, right? Um, so, you know, and, and maybe this kind of makes sense. Uh, you're going to, when you take an action, you get to some new state, and your future payoffs is a quadratic function plus a constant. It doesn't matter what that constant is, right? And so, in order to compute the optimal action, uh, in order to compute LT, you need to, you need to know phi, or actually phi t plus one, but you don't need to know what is psi t plus one, right? Now, if you look at the way we do the dynamic programming, the backwards recursion, um, what if you implement a piece of code that doesn't bother to compute psi, right? So these are the two equations you use, update phi and psi, but what if, you know, let's say you delete this line of code, just don't bother to compute it, and just don't bother to compute that, and don't bother to compute that, right? So you notice that phi depends on phi t plus one, but it doesn't depend on psi. Um, and so you could implement the whole thing and compute the auto policy and compute the auto actions without ever computing psi, right? Now, the funny thing about this is that the only place that sigma w appears is that it affects only psi t, right? So, you know, if, if we do what I just cross out in orange and just don't bother to compute psi t, then the whole algorithm doesn't even use sigma w, right? So one very interesting property of the LQR, um, uh, uh, of this formalism is that the optimal policy does not depend on sigma w, right? Um, and I think uh, maybe this is a, uh, the, so V star depends on sigma w because if the noise is very large, if there are huge gusts of wind blowing your helicopter all over the place, then the value would be worse. But pi star and LT uh, do not depend on sigma w, okay? Um, so this is a property that's very specific to LQR. Don't, don't, don't overgeneralize it to other reinforcement learning algorithms. But this, um, I think the intuition to uh, um, take from this is first, if you're actually applying the system, you know, don't bother to, don't, don't, like, so don't, don't try too hard to estimate sigma w because you're not actually, you, you don't actually need to use it, uh, which is why, when we're fitting a linear model, I didn't talk too much about how you actually estimate sigma w because in the LQR system, it literally doesn't matter in a, in a mathematical sense in terms of what is the optimal policy you compute. And then the second, there may be slightly useful intuition to take away from this is that um, for a lot of MDPs, if you're building a robot, you know, uh, um, remember to add some noise to your system, but the exact noise you add doesn't matter as much as one might think. So what I've seen in, in working with a lot of robots, a lot of MDPs is, you know, do add some noise to the system and make sure your learning algorithm is robust to noise. And the form of the noise you add, it does matter. I don't want to say it doesn't matter at all. I mean, in LQR, it doesn't matter at all. For other MDPs, it does matter. But I think the fact that you're remembering to add some noise is often, in practice, more important than the exact details of, you know, is the noise 10% higher or the noise 10% lower? If, if the noise is 100% higher or lower, that will often make a big difference. But, uh, but, but when I'm, you know, training a model for a helicopter or something, the noise is something that, you know, I pay a little bit of attention to, but I pay much more attention to making sure that the matrices A and B are accurate. Then, and then if, you know, a little bit of sloppiness in the accuracy of your noise model is something that an MTP could probably survive, that your policy could survive. Okay, let's take one last question, then we should break. Oh, V, uh, V, oh, uh, oh, I see. Uh, sorry, yes, let me see my notes. Uh, v, that was a, B, this is a V, yes. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, cool, thanks everyone. Let's break and then we'll see you for the final lecture on Wednesday. Thanks everyone. <laughs>